The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Welcome to Speak Up. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. And today we're going to introduce you to another candidate, Marilyn Garcia, or is it Mary Linda? Mary Linda. Mary Linda Garcia. And uh, Mary Linda, uh, you and I served, uh, I served 2010 through 12, and you actually sat at the end of the row, and uh, you had to put up with me coming out of the <laughs> row from time to time. But you always had candy in your I always had candy, yes. <laughs> so I was the candy man, and there was a reason for that. But welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, you're a candidate for the uh, Congress. Yeah, second district. Second district here in New Hampshire. And uh, how's it going? It's going really well. Mm -hmm. It's been... Uh, you know, I, I've been in since the end of November, so there have been different phases of the campaign, but this is the one where we're emphasizing getting out in the field. So I have a great team of volunteers. My office is based in Concord mm -hmm. on Pleasant Street, so anyone's welcome to come by any time, including yourself. Right, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, we That's have right signs. off Main Street, by the yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. It's a few blocks from the State House. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have phones, we're making calls all the time. It's full of you know volunteers and interns and we do door knocking we knocked about 5,000 doors last weekend and we'll continue that uh, throughout this season and overall just there's been a lot of good momentum mm -hmm. we got the union leader endorsement uh, this past All weekend right. wow, good for you. yeah so overall it's been great great feedback I think you know the message is resonating and it's exciting now you remember the HRA when I first met you and I remember it was Dan McGuire who said something to the effect that this is an up-and-coming star in the Republican Party. And basically, uh, the HRA was those who uh, held to really close to the party platform, if you well, will. Well, actually, it was more than that. What we would do, you know, it had a philosophical purpose mm -hmm. and then also a very, you know, strategic, concrete role. And that is that every piece of legislation that would be going before the House we would first take and vet it according to the platform and the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that's the New Hampshire Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. There's nothing but, wrong with that. <laughs> no. Right. I think we should do more of that mm -hmm. um, as elected officials. But in any case, based on how we thought you know, it measured up, we would offer a recommendation to the House that we would you know, list. So you know, this is the bill. This is what it's about. Here's our recommendation that you support it or oppose it based on how it um, measured up to, you know, and then we'd cite the specific article or a uh, plank of the platform. And, you know, it was just, a, it was a really good way to be sure that we keep our eye on the ball. And that is that we all swore to uphold the Constitution. And if, you know, you ran on the Republican ticket, more or less you ought to be agreeing with. Right. And know, it was a way for, for the, your constituents or to, to measure your performance. So, mm -hmm. Basically, if, if, if uh, we're staying close to the Constitution or ideally uh, in, in line with the Constitution, uh, that's a wonderful thing. But if you, you stray from it, mm -hmm. uh, people should know that so that there's a little bit of truth in labeling. Because now and then, you know, people are busy. They're doing their jobs. It's hard for you to keep track. And, and what we're trying to do is, is monitor and make everybody accountable, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of what the HRA yeah. did. Well, you know, it was, sure, there's the accountability aspect at the end of the game, but really it's about achieving, you know, and passing or halting what we considered good or damaging legislation. Because at right. the end of the day, I think the most important function was offering 
that guide, mm -hmm. kind of a you know voter guide for elected officials voting in the House. Right. You know, so because that's the point. If right. we don't want laws to pass that we feel are you know in violation of. So what kind of committees did you did you sit on? I started off in uh, children and family law. So I just finished my fourth term. So first I was on children and family law. Then I served on election law and a legislative administration, as well as my last two terms, I was in uh, on the finance committee. So that's a wide spectrum. That's yeah. a wide spectrum. It's good. It was uh, on the finance committee, obviously, our main role was, at least the way I saw it, was to be sure that we are being good stewards of the taxpayer resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, to that effect, you know, we would put together the budget, go through the budget process. And, um, you know, depending on what division you're in, you oversee different agencies and departments. And the, you know, commissioners and staff come through, you go by it, through the budget, you know, line by line and, you know, make sure that, especially in response to, for example, the recession we had and our $800 million. Uh, debt hole, budget hole, uh, that was a problem. Um, and so, you know, our job is to make sure that our state uh, stays afloat, uh, is being fiscally responsible, is not uh, creating an unsustainable, um, you know, way of needing to find more revenue, meaning your tax dollars, my tax dollars, um, and so on and so forth. Do you think the Medicaid expansion helped? Not budget. at all. Not at all. It's actually we can't afford it. So it's, it's just boggles bogg 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 my mind. Uh, I, you know, the whole idea. Can I ask you a, a, just off topic? You, you remember when the, the Obamacare was was passed and mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi said that we have to pass it. So we'll know it's in it. <laughs> have you ever seen that? Anything like that in the House? No. And it, well, that would just no. look really yeah. awkward, right? It's just. The thought, you know, and this was the leader, mind you. Right. You know, this wasn't just some sort of neophyte who had, you know, just come in and had no idea what was going on. I mean, to me, her saying that just showed that they would go to any lengths, didn't care, you know, if they were, uh, frankly, perverting the process that right. we have in place, didn't care that they were selling this and basically foisting it upon us on false premises, lies, and complete misinformation or no information. I right. mean, she said it herself. Um, and the point is that they were just showing they were going to make these promises. This is what they wanted to accomplish, and that, of course, is you know a single-payer system, government centralization, more government control, um, less access, um, and um, you know the ability of you and me, the citizen, to be empowered make decisions for ourselves. Anyway, the point is they were willing to pass it no matter what, even though, you know, it was still being written and she didn't even know what was in it already. So right. they just didn't care. That was what that was telling. It didn't go before committees. It didn't, it wasn't, the public didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So I just can't see that happening in New Hampshire. But somebody was rumoring that the, that, that something like that's happening right now. Mm. That the, uh, Governor Hassan was trying to pass something, but maybe they, they put a, a halt to it. But I, you know, I believe it was Ann Custer. She was part of this whole process. Yeah, well, so I'm running against Ann Custer. She's been um, serving as the congresswoman for the second district now. This is her first term. And uh, there are a few things that are notable in, in their absence, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. You know, she hasn't hosted a town hall in an effort to communicate, you know, or be responsive to her constituents for her entire term. And then when it comes to big issues of the day, obviously, you know, Obamacare being one of them, keep in mind, this is a state where we have 26 hospitals. Ten of them are out of network, and right. seven of those are in her district. What do you mean by that, out of network? Meaning that they aren't on the, oh, the exchange. You know, in other words, when they say to you, oh, you know, now we have Obamacare and expanded Medicaid and all these things in the state, that gives you the illusion that, oh, now more people can afford and access health care. Mm -hmm. In fact, what that means is certain people with certain insurance can't, can no longer go to the hospitals they were used to because uh, their insurance provider isn't covered there anymore. Would you vote so, to get rid of Obamacare? Absolutely. But here's the thing. Ann Custer, knowing all this, knowing that New Hampshire has seen some of the most adverse effects of Obamacare, she said that had she been there when it passed, 
this was a few months ago, she definitely would have voted for it. This is still. Yeah, this is Representative. Custer, I do think so. there was one. If I, I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. There was one time in where she, we, we were talking about the, the Middle East, and uh, I think she kind of bungled that. And it had to do with the Benghazi issue. Yeah, uh, she was at a meeting, and uh, someone asked her a question about a House resolution relating to the tragedy, you know, incident in Benghazi, and. Um, she first seemed to not know that there was such a piece of legislation. They informed her, you know, this was a citizen, you know, just <laughs> constituent mind. You informed her that, yes, it was, in fact, before her committee. And then at that point, she um, didn't know why Benghazi was important and said, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the Middle East at which point there was a big uproar, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, basically that's obviously uh, was a huge international incident, an enormous uh, security issue. Um, and the fact that, you know, she didn't really have much to say or seem to have any bit of knowledge about that was problematic. But the worst part, because look, we could have a you know, dispute about, okay, is that the Middle East? Is it North Africa? You know, fine, if you want to <laughs> grant her that. But that wasn't the point. The point was she had nothing to say and then, in fact, left the stage. Right. And, so, and I think now we're looking at, a, a, you know, fast forward, we're looking at the world's on fire. Oh, oh my and, gosh. And, you know, we, we can't be, ask you to be an expert on, on the entire world, but at the same time, you got to be a little bit in touch with your constituents and people. Yeah. And, and at least watch the news or, you know, and, sure. and, and watch a various channels well, or something. Well, as a congressperson, one, you are, you have access to a lot more information, you know, in real time right. than the rest of us do who actually do watch it, <laughs> you know, on the news. Uh, but the other issue, you know, to your point is, sure, you know, do I know how to solve all the world's problems right now? No, of course not. But you have to believe that one that you elect to represent you and you as Congress will be well informed, use their best judgment in the situations that come up, and at the end of the day, are able to you know cast votes and act in the best interest of America, because that that is the point uh, here. So you know it, we are we're in a scary world right now. I mean, and most of what's occurring, I think, has been a direct result of the. U.S. and meaning the our president and um, all of his administration and the weakness they signal. Um, which, you know they have no clarity invites, of purpose. Which invites trouble. Uh, Instability uh, and you uh, have everyone running rampant. I, I don't know if you. Uh, I'm just transfixed in the most horrible way. You know, right now Israel and Palestine is in the news a lot and what's going on there. But uh, I don't know if you've kept up with what's going on in Iraq with uh, ISIS and now the yeah. Islamic State. I mean, the fact that they have literally evicted and actually beheaded, killed, you know, um, all of the Christians in the region, there are no more. In my opinion, and I'm just, I'm, I'm just, it's my, it's whatever, take it for what it's worth. I believe that Hamas is, is basically uh, throwing out these indiscriminate uh, bombs at Israel for a smoke screen. In, in, to a, a diversion, and it'll end. And I, I, I really feel sorry for Israel because of this. But I think when you look at 100,000 people in Syria, right. when when you look at what's going on in Russia, when you look at Hamas is supported by Iran. We mm -hmm. know that. Mm -hmm. They're the, they've killed more Americans than any other terrorist group other than maybe uh, the Taliban, uh, if not equally. If, over over time, Al Qaeda. Yeah. They're they're basically a satellite of Iran. Iran's going to have that bomb. They have now they have one of our stealth, whatever you want to call them. It just landed there. Mm. They, they can you know there's a lot of things no, that are there, real troubling. There are a number <laughs> of uh, you know in foreign affairs and international relations. I think um, never mind. I, I think three of our greatest threats. I was talking about this on close up the other morning. Um, one is nuclear proliferation. We see that with Iran. Really frightening, really problematic. And again, why? Because our president seems to be willing to uh, accept, you know, a bad deal just because then he can say he did something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's that whole attitude of, oh, I got bin Laden, we're done now. You know, I'm a hero, etc. That's a huge problem, you know, so we need to be tough with them. 
The other is we've seen a return of the um, you know, resurgence of this power struggle with uh, Russia and China. Um, so that's really, really problematic. They see that we are very... Um, I'm surprised uh, North Korea hasn't flexed a little bit more muscles recently. Yeah, well, you know, but they're, they're a perfect example, again, of what's the situation in Iran right now. Um, then the, the third is, of course, just international terrorism. I mean, it's frightening. Right. Uh, energy. You know, this, this pipeline, uh, the Keystone Pipeline, why, why can't we, can't Congress push to get this thing open? It's being blocked by the president. That's and the Senate. all there is to it. Yeah, well, in the Senate. So, um, and we know that, you know, this, uh, what is it, Tim Steyer, and basically all the radical, radical leftist ideological. Um, Isn't that, I know what you're going to say, but he's got $100 million that he's giving to the Democratic Party. Does, does that mean the president and can be bought? Of course. To, to, to stop? <laughs> he had the most expensive campaign in history. So a billion dollars. If if a, if a billionaire wants to come into America and, and say, look, well, I'll, I'll bid you for mm -hmm. this energy uh, to this pipeline, mm -hmm. there, th that's got to resonate with the American people. I think people have to be outraged by this to the point where enough is enough is enough. Who are you to buy my interest? Mm -hmm. This, this well, is cronyism at its worst. They want to hang on to. They're so afraid that they're going to be losing seats. And lose their, you know, stranglehold, stranglehold on, you know, power in the Senate, and just have. Unfortunately, the president will still be there, but uh, you know, he'll be pretty ineffective. How are you going to keep in touch with the people? I think people feel so alienated mm -hmm. from their representatives at yeah. this point. Uh, right now, it, it, you know, they they say what they want, they stick the finger up in the air. We've been watching this for years. They yeah. promise you the world. Uh, they get to Washington, and all of a sudden, you get the kick in the gut because. Well, you know, there was a backroom deal, and leadership didn't want this to happen. I'm sick of it. Mm. Uh, a lot of people are. Yeah. Uh, and they're losing faith in our system. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is I don't promise the world. <laughs> I really try to, you know, I, I hate to overpromise and underdeliver. I think that's one of the worst things. So the way I go about it is I'm campaigning, you know, telling you what I believe and what I want to accomplish. Mm. I'm not going to promise you, you know, what I'm going to accomplish because... Who knows? You right. know, I am just a small drop in the congressional bucket, but... But you're our voice. Well, that's the point. You know, at the end of the day, I need to be advocating for you. I need to be representing you. And I think the more uh, sincere uh, people we have up there actually doing that, the more the real voice of America will be heard. Um, I, don't, I don't like, you know, holding my finger to the wind and paying attention to polls. And, you know, I won't if I tell someone, you know, my position on an issue and they say, well, I can't support you, I'm sorry about that. But at the same time, I'm a little relieved, you know, because <laughs> that means to me, okay, well, if I'm elected and I told people what I support and where I stand, then that means that's the way I'm going to vote. And I have a clear conscience about it, right? Same right. thing with donations and all that. I'm not going to contort myself, you know, to get elected and try to appease everyone. I would rather... Uh, lose, you know, knowing that I was honest and authentic than when knowing, you know, that I was selling myself in a deceitful way. So that's the way I go about it. And sure, you know, I've never served in Washington before, but that's the approach I intend, you know, to take there. And to the best of my ability, I would, uh, I really will try to be sure that I'm remaining true to those things. Well, the New Hampshire legislature seems to be one of the best ways to to groom somebody to represent you to be to represent in Washington yeah. because you do learn the committees mm -hmm. you have to write legislation mm -hmm. and you have you you mm -hmm. had some actually I think I co-sponsored one with you it had yeah. to do with the medical uh, yeah um, allowing for development in the specialty sector better right. health care for more people at a lower cost that's what it's all about but you know I remember just when we first got there you had to learn the whole process and sure. it was like going through a fire hose Drinking out of a fire hose, but then you, you, you serve four terms. Yeah. Which well, means you've, you've gone to committees. You, sure. You, people, you've seen both sides of issues. Right. You had to make a stand. Right. Well, that and, you know, you learn how to think critically. Right. Which I think is important because a lot of legislation that um, we're asked to consider 
on a surface level or theoretically, you know, it sounds like a good thing, but you really have to learn how to think in a way to, you know, what we started with. Is the underlying principle or philosophy of this in contradiction to the Constitution, you know, to smaller government, mm -hmm. lower taxes, individual freedom, personal responsibility? And, uh, you know, those are things you need to be sure you're considering because otherwise uh, there are a lot of emotional appeals. There are a lot of, you know, financial interests and, you know, things legislation that comes through and sure there's a lot of good reasons to support everything mm -hmm. but uh, you really have to be sure that you're holding firm to the things you said you would do. I think one of the things that might be a little different is the fact that they bundle things in Washington. That I don't like at all. I think in terms of process um, that's something I would love to change and you know be working to advance legislation that's not like that because to, to your point you know when you look at Health care, immigration, for example, two big issues. They always try to pass this comprehensive, you right. know, bill. And what does that mean? To me, it means... Slide in the ground. Well, no, not even that. But it means there are some good actual reforms in it. And there are some atrocious, awful things that I would never support. And the, this bill comes forward. And you end up, you know, the ones who vote for it then are traitors. You know, and the ones that vote against it are obstructionists, right? right? And then it either passes or doesn't. You know, nobody's happy, and everybody says we have a do-nothing Congress with the collective IQ of pond scum and the popularity of, you know, the Ebola virus. That's <laughs> basically what happens, and I think it's really unfortunate. We should, to, uh, you know, again, I need to know, you know, how this process works, and uh, I, I, I want to advance targeted, targeted specific reforms. That's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of room in the middle where I think we can all agree this needs to be done, that needs to be done. Let's do it and not make it a Christmas tree. Of right. And things. New Hampshire, that's the way we do it. We do it one bill at a time. We yeah. look at it, we do one community at a time. That might take a, a long time to do it, but I think that's the way the founders uh, wanted it and intended things to slow the process down. We don't want you up there making a whole bunch of laws. You know, maybe you can Take some off the books, yeah. right? Well, everyone I talk to, I'll tell you, I was just in Wilton today, you know, talking to um, people at the farmer's market, some small businesses, and, you know, they say, gosh, you know, it's so hard keeping up with the regulations. They're just out of control. I was ask you about that. They're yeah. out of control, and they said, you know, this one gentleman who has a candy store in the town, you know, since the early 1900s, it's a family store, he said, the only way I'm here still right now is because, you know, we've been at this for about 100 years and everything's paid off. You know, mm. I'm able to just make the, um, you know, adaptations and, you know, fall in line with these different compliance issues, regulations. And uh, he says, but I have, every, you know, I own everything here, so it's much easier. But he mm. said, if I were young, I would never start this right now. If there's no impossible. way. There's, it's just, there's no way. Uh, right now, it, it seems so hard, and that's why people aren't even looking at yeah. New Hampshire itself. But um, you look at the EPA, you look at the Department of Education, you look at the Department of Transportation, you look at all these other organizations where when they create a rule, it has the effect of law, mm -hmm. and the people don't have a say. Right. And these laws are what we are calling regulations. Yeah, well, and that's what's most insidious, I believe, about what this administration has been doing. In almost every instance, when... When they try to get away with things, be it through Obamacare or this IRS scandal or the VA, whatever the situation is, and there have been so many, mm -hmm. um, it comes to the public's attention. Everybody's angry, you know, or the Supreme Court says something is unconstitutional, or the Congress, you know, votes for something. Or anyway, the point is, what do they do? All of a sudden, a few weeks later, you hear, oh, they're using, you know, the power of that agency and the rulemaking authority, and they're doing it anyway, just through the rules, which completely circumvents the process that we have in place. Right. And uh, I think even the courts are guilty of that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my big push, the CACR 26, mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, judges making law, mm -hmm. the rules that have the effect of law. It just seems to be so contrary to what our founders wanted. Uh, and these agencies, and, and nobody, can, nobody can have any recourse. And then people feel powerless, and they're throwing up their hands. Well, why? Well, I'll get on the dole. I saw a picture on Facebook. It, it had to be true. Uh, but it, there were a bunch of sandals in line, and everybody was sitting on the bench, and they were all looking at their, their iPads, and they were just waiting to be next to, to get their, their check from Social Security or, 
health. And I'm thinking, is this the new America mm -hmm. that we're looking at? Whatever happened to innovation and people, the lemonade stand turning into, you know, orange crush or something to that effect. You know, I think, I, I think these rules have, have squashed the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, uh, a congressman, will you, congresswoman, how, how, how will, what will you do to, to change this? I mean, are, are you going to introduce legislation to, to back these people off? Are you going to, how are you going to fight for us? Mm. Well, uh, the first thing is obviously, again, advocating and then voting, mm -hmm. you know, accordingly, um, as we do in the New Hampshire legislature. When it comes to regulation, you know, unless there's something specific you want to repeal, you know, you introduce legislation to accomplish that. But otherwise, you don't introduce legislation because right. that creates more. So, right. um, so it's really just um, something that I think, you know, also the committee process um, is important too, because that's where, you know, you really understand the nexus of, you know, the legislation that's occurring and how it affects this particular, you know, industry or sector. And so, you know, there are a lot of ways to go about it. But overall, you just have to be fighting against over overreach of the federal government and overregulation. What's your website? It is MaryLindaGarcia.com. Mm -hmm. That's M-A-R-I-L-I-N-D-A-G-A-R-C-I-A.com. Now, you have those big signs just waiting to be put out there. Are <laughs> yeah. you looking for sign locations? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And if, you want to write some down? For me? <laughs> <laughs> well, That's we'll good. get it out there. Yeah, if uh, anybody wants to put one up, that would be fantastic. And, and usually they, they're more effective than just being put out there. And if you can put them on your lawn or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, obviously, you know, private property where someone who's a supporter puts it up is the best. And then beyond that, if, you know, you know your town best, as especially someone who's run, you know, mm -hmm. for state rep and... Uh, so you know, you know, what is area that one could put up a sign legally. And, and where does your area cover? Oh, so, well, I live in Salem. I've been representing Salem, but um, the second district is kind of an L shape. So it's the southern border of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and it's up the west side of the state, or you could say half of the state, you know, middle to west. And then above North Conway, it's uh, the whole northern part of the state up to Canada. So it's okay. a lot of geography. I've been traveling all over the place. Yeah. Guilford is part of that? No. Uh, Guilford, no. No? Okay. No. Just uh, trying to think of you know, Conway. Well, that's, that's I'm not, uh, my, my map. You in need my, to look at the map. They redistrict the they, they <laughs> Okay. And so, again, the website is Marilinda, uh, your, your website? MarilindaGarcia.com. Dot com. And sign locations, is there a, an email or just go to the website? Uh, just, yeah, the website, you know, and then you reach contact at marylindagarcia.com. Well, we wish you the best. Thank you. Any Appreciate closing it. thoughts to, to the people that are watching? Um, I would really, you know, hope you check out my site, see what's going on, and would appreciate your support. Great. Thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. And that's it for now on Speak Up. Please get in contact with Mary Lynn if you want to learn a little bit more about her candidacy and her race. Uh, maybe you want her as your, your uh, congresswoman, the next congresswoman. Until next week, thanks for watching. Speak Up. If you would like to be a guest on Speak Up, please contact me at speakupnh at gmail.com. We'll help you be heard. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.